Good evening, Dr. So, Maya. Uh, thank you so much. Um, welcome to this uh, this evening's CME. It's about maternal mortality, of course, as regards to thrombosis. My name is Dr. Maya Muko, a medical advisor to Sanofi. And uh, today we're going to discuss a bit about maternal mortality, a bit of something that I'd researched on, and I found out that um, we are at, actually at 530. And uh, I could see this as a live graph from the WHO website that uh, maternal mortality as per 100,000 live births is up by 530. So we are not going down and we're going up. So today we have a very special guest, not just a guest, but a speaker. And uh, he's a renowned professor. He has done a lot of work in obstetrics <clears throat> and gynecology. Right. Currently, he's a professor and chairman of the Department of Human Anatomy, where most of us uh, had schooled as medical doctors. He's married, of course, and um, in addition to that, he has done a lot of research on maternal safety in childbirth, and has led many programs, including programs, uh, of course alluding to the uterine vascular system impact of HIV and intravirals on placental microenvironments. And his current work is studying the omics of the pathways, of course, in reproductive biology. So today we'll have on board a doctor. Also, I like calling off him doctor, but he's also Professor Moses Obibo from, of course, uh, University of Nairobi. He's an obstetric and gynecologist, and also he's a secretary to the COGS, or that's called Kenya Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. So maybe he can explain to us what this 530 means today. And uh, I looked into a certain study done in central Kenya about, uh, of course, maternal mortality and uh, discussing what are the key issues in maternal mortality, especially when you're dealing with thrombosis. And uh, it's very dangerous for us to like have a baby in the sub-Saharan region, right? And uh, most of the causes of maternal, of course, included diabetes, malaria, HIV, obesity. But the leading cause, of course, came to hemorrhage, uh, pregnancy-induced high blood pressure, infections mostly after childbirth, obstructive labor, and uh, of course, abortion complications and blood clots, which is thrombosis. So today, Dr. or Professor Moses Obimbo will lead us in a discussion about a thrombosis and how to reduce maternal mortality as regards to thrombosis. So without further ado, I want to uh, really introduce one of them. If he's not your mentor, he should be uh, one of the biggest uh, names in uh, obstetrics and gynecology. I want to introduce uh, Professor Bimbo to discuss this key topic of uh, maternal mortality and, of course, uh, a thrombosis in pregnancy and obstetrics. Welcome, Dr. Ari. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Amaya. I really appreciate that introduction. And I appreciate everyone who's joined into this uh, uh, particular forum. As uh, mentioned, I'm Obimbo Moses. I'm from the Department of Human Anatomy and Medical Physiology, the current chair, but I'm also a practicing gynecologist and a scientist. And uh, this evening, I'm very happy to lead the discussion. Uh, I'll basically make, make it a discussion because I think there are quite a number of issues that are controversial in this topic. And if you allow me to share my screen, I'll share it straight. So we're going to have um, this discussion on uh, venous thromboembolic diseases in pregnancy and uh, puperium. Uh, the main content of this particular discussion would focus on whether we really need to uh, do prophylaxis or don't we need to do prophylaxis. Uh, 
Dr. Maya just presented a slide that's quite shocking. Uh, we know in the recent KDHS relays, we do not have um, data on maternal mortality and other aspects of uh, maternal health in the um, write-up. I think the explanation was that the sample size was uh, minimum to, for them to be able to make some adequate analysis. But we know that uh, maternal mortality is a big issue and all of us uh, should play a role in one way or the other to reduce this particular burden. One of the aspects that uh, contributes to the high maternal mortality we know is uh, venous thromboembolism and is a part of spectrum of uh, diseases that we know from epidemiological transition, people suffering highly from infectious diseases now Non-infectious diseases have become a big subject and can actually contribute to large amounts of mortality. So I will be able to explain and discuss this webinar with you. And uh, the main content of this webinar, we want at the end of this discussion to basically understand the risk factors for thromboembolism in uh, pregnancy. Uh, we'll try to make it short, 30 minutes to allow for discussion at the end. And then we look at what are these components and uh, papers that have been written on uh, how we prevent and treat uh, thromboembolic diseases in pregnancy. And then uh, later on also dis uh, try to look at our context. What do we do? And most of this will be an open discussion from the colleagues in this particular um, uh, discussion to look at what do you do and what's the basis of you uh, doing what you do in practice in terms of prevention of uh, uh, thromboembolic diseases in preparium or in pregnancy. So these are major highlights of the points that we'll be looking at. Uh, but before I progress, I just want to know from the, uh, from the audience uh, how many people have had some experience in managing uh, venous thromboembolic events in pregnancy. I just want to hear two, three stories, and then maybe that would help us so much anchor uh, this particular lecture. Uh, do we have anyone who has had some experience? And I'm happy to uh, have your hand up. You can use the hand um, uh, function to show. I just want to know how many of us have had some experience uh, in managing VT in pregnancy. Uh, anyone? Right, uh -huh. Dr. Moreno Witte, okay. Uh, what was your experience? How was your experience? And how did it come along? Dr. Maureen, I hope you're able to, un to unmute. Uh-huh. Dr. Maureen, uh, can't you? Sorry, okay. I've, I've been unmuted. It took some time for the host to unmute. No problem. It's okay. Thanks. Um, it was a very interesting case whereby it's um it was uh, a staff, and um though I was seeing her privately. And can you hear me, Obimbo? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, thank you. And uh, she's somebody who had had a VTE outside of pregnancy. And this was known uh, from the moment she was uh, uh, gravid. Her first pregnancy, unfortunately, ended as a miscarriage about 24 weeks, uh, though she was on prophylaxis. Uh, but it was just uh, a PPROM. Second pregnancy was successful. And she was on thromboprophylaxis throughout and even in the puparium. But what was interesting for us was, despite being in the puparium on thromboprophylaxis, she still had um, a, thromb a, a massive thromboembolism about two weeks postpartum. And that for me was what was very interesting. Uh, I think hematologists have been on board on her management. I can't remember that she had a protein C or protein S, one of those uh, deficiencies, but... Um, it was, quite, it was quite a stressful thing because it's like you feel you've done the right thing. You've put the patient throughout on thromboprophylaxis, but despite all this, she still got an event. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, very uh, sad. And many but, others, but that was yes. the one for me that I can remember at the moment. Stood out. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think from your points, you, you raised very important points that she had a, a miscarriage before. And then in this kind of index pregnancy, she uh, underwent prophylaxis throughout, and uh, this was also maintained uh, postpartum. And uh, uh, while on it, she actually had an event, a traumatic event. Uh, yeah, so there are quite a number of points that we, we need to pick from your, your experience. Any other person? I just want two, two uh, experiences, then we can be able to discuss some of the science behind this. Any other person? I know Dr. Ayub. You've had some experience? Okay, Dr. Gingo. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Prof. Um, my, um, I, well, I've, I'm, 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 I'm a general ops guy in, that sees patients generally, and we've quite managed quite a number of patients. But my main experience or my own main issues is that do we ever get to fully anticoagulate these patients? Do, they, do we ever give them enough anticoagulation to prevent the, the, VT, <coughs> the, the VTE? Like the previous speaker was saying, of course, I think the patient had other issues. <coughs> As he shall say that maybe she had other issues, a methodological issue, but the issue is that do we ever fully anticoagulated, we ever fully give enough prophylaxis to prevent. That, 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 is, a, that, 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 that is my issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Steven. Mm. Thank you, yeah. So uh, from those two uh, discussion points, you realize there are quite a number of issues that are not very clear. One, uh, what's the optimum dosage uh, do we give for uh, prophylaxis, what do we call optimal? Do we give low dose? Do we give moderate dose? Do we give high dose uh, for prophylaxis? What would guide you in giving a certain dose? And I must mention from the word go that we do not have high quality data that guides uh, the dosing uh, mechanism. So it's all left at the behest of the clinician to make the decision on how much dosing, depending on the risk assessment that the clinician has made on a particular patient. The other issue that is very obvious here is a multidisciplinary approach to management. Uh, when these patients come in they, and we look at what are these risk factors, there are a number of risk factors that are probably beyond us as the OBGYN in the room. And therefore we need to get other experts to manage. And of course, I'm very excited to hear from Dr. Maureen's experience that they had hematologists on board to, to have this, uh, this done. So uh, I must mention also from the word go that uh, data on this particular subject is minimal. And there has been complaint that uh, you know, high quality data, uh, especially to talk about the issues affecting mostly uh, women has been neglected for a long time. And this, this is a campaign to make this change because then we do not have very good data to inform our decisions in clinical uh, decision-making. Number two, uh, from Africa, I tried to look around uh, for the evidence and the papers published uh, a few observations that we made. Uh, yes, a few studies have been done, uh, but sometimes the design of these studies is, is not very good to generate data that can be used as high quality evidence. And number two, the sample sizes that have been used are very small and therefore uh, it's very difficult to make a great sense of, uh, of this particular data. And uh, there's always every paper that's written with minimal sample size or every review that has been done, the last point is always that we need studies with large sample size, well-designed to be able to evaluate the burden of venous thromboembolic diseases in, uh, in Africa. So as it is right now from our African perspective, we do not have very good data to guide our decisions, but it's also the same uh, around the world. Uh, if you look at the RCOG guidelines and on how they manage patients with uh, uh, at risk of uh, VTE uh, and versus the American college, you get quite a lot of discrepancy 
in the kind of decisions and the women who qualify for uh, prophylaxis. For example, in uh, in the US, you'll get about uh, seven out of a thousand women qualifying for uh, you know prophylaxis, whereas in the UK, you get about thirty-seven out of a thousand women qualifying for prophylaxis, and this just shows you the discrepancy of the data. And therefore, most of us working in this particular space need to invest some time to do some data to generate good results so that we can guide our management. So uh, as we know um, that this particular problem uh, is one of the major causes of uh, direct maternal, maternal death. And uh, one of the systematic reviews recently has shown that uh, the prevalence of VTE uh, in Africa is quite, is quite high. And I'm going to give you the, some of the data. And it's approximated that about a quarter to half a number of patients who need to be exposed to prophylaxis do not actually get prophylaxis. Then we know that if you do not treat uh, DVT uh, or uh, you know, pulmonary embolism, definitely it could result in further complications for life that reduce quality of life, including post-thrombotic syndrome and also the chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, which will significantly reduce the quality of uh, the woman who has this particular uh, problem. We also know, in summary, that pregnancy increases the risk of one developing uh, uh, VTE by about four to six times. And for women who experience uh, cesarean section delivery are at greater risk uh, of developing uh, uh, venous thromboembolism than those with the vaginal delivery. Uh, various studies in various aspects, including one that was done by uh, our student, Dr. Micheni, uh, showed that uh, most of the DVT developed during antepartum period, the distribution is uh, equivocal. Some say it's equally distributed over gestations, whereas some say it goes higher during the third trimester. Uh, but by and large, is that the highest risk is during the pregnancy. And of course, we also have uh, 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 some occurring during postpartum uh, period. And of course, those with untreated uh, DVT would probably end up with a pulmonary embolism, about 15%, and 30% of them could easily die as a result of that. So why is a pregnancy a risk factor for one developing uh, vascular uh, venous thromboembolism. We remind ourselves about the concept of the virtuous triad and uh, these issues. We look at the venous stasis, and uh, this has been described uh, mostly in the literature. You know, in pregnancy, you have high levels of uh, progesterone, and this particular hormone definitely would lead to vasodilatation, the physiological vasodilatation of these particular vessels, and in so doing, you have stasis of uh, blood moving through these vessels. And the other concept is about uh, mechanical compression of particular vessels. And it's been shown between week about 24 to about week 30 of pregnancy, as the uterus grows, it compresses the vessels within the pelvis cavity. And one of the vessels that is greatly compresses the iliac, il iliac veins, common iliac veins. And when these veins are compressed, then definitely we have the stasis. And that's very, uh, we know very well from our basic pathology classes is a risk factor for uh, developing a venous thromboembolism. The other concept that's highly discussed is the pregnancy and the hypercoagulability. And uh, as we know, evolutionary, that during pregnancy, uh, the woman is protected naturally from, uh, you know, exterminating, bleeding to death. And this happens by basically increasing the amount of the clotting factors in the system. And uh, they have done quite a lot of research. And uh, these factors have been shown to be the ones most affected. The factor five, factor seven, factor eight, uh, fibrinogen, and so forth, they increase in pregnancy. Whereas at the same time, you have uh, what Dr. Maureen was mentioning, the protein C and the protein S uh, ratios are affected. So with this increase in hypercoagulable state, the woman is definitely exposed to high risk of uh, uh, thrombus formation. Then 
The other concept is about the tissue damage, and mostly this uh, tissue damage will occur either at the later part of the pregnancy or just at the uh, time of delivery. And what happens in this particular uh, condition, we know that endothelium is very important in uh, release of the nitric, acid, uh, nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide plays a very important role in increasing the capacitance of the vessels that supply both the placenta. Uh, in one of the works I did long time ago in the uterine vascular system, and looking at the changes of the uterine artery in pregnancy, the terminal end of the uterine vascular system demonstrated definite uh, you know, modification. Of course, we know partly would be from the placental uh, involvement and partly because of the endogenous uh, endothelium, which makes these vessels uh, a bit larger. And there's a lot of production of what you call angiogenic factors that would increase also development of uh, new blood vessels. But if you have injury of these particular uh, vessels at the endothelial level, then what happens is an imbalance between the angiogenic and antiogenic factors, which definitely now lead to impaired production of nitric oxide, eventually leading to other uh, elements. Uh, for example, the production of uh, soluble endoglins or soluble uh, flutes that result in other cases like uh, preeclampsia or put these women at risk of preeclampsia and so forth. So tissue damage is a very important concept in considering in the formation of uh, venous thromboembolic uh, diseases. So some of the key factors that have been shown uh, and there have been very many authors uh, and researchers trying to look at how do we profile women who would be at greater risk of uh, getting VTE versus those ones who will be at a lesser risk of getting v, uh, VTE. Uh, and whether you have, when you have one of these risk factors as a component is enough for you to have uh, prophylaxis, or do you have to have multiple of these factors for you to have uh, prophylaxis? So the three most important factors that have been uh, uh, proposed and considered as very high risk for uh, uh, venous thromboembolic diseases would include the previous history of one having uh, VTE. Uh, you can see the odds ratio uh, there. Uh, thrombophilia, if uh, this history, family history, or the individual has a history of uh, thrombophilia, then they are considered to be high risk. And of course, those patients with the antiphospholipid syndrome, which you talked about in the recurrent pregnancy losses. Uh, so patients with this uh, syn uh, syndrome would definitely have very high risk. And you can see those odds ratios are quite, quite high. Uh, so when you have women with this particular uh, history, then one has to be alert. And the question would be, would you start uh, these women straight on prophylaxis or won't you start them on prophylaxis? We'll come to that at a better uh, later time. The other risk factors that have been proposed and have been shown to have variable, uh, sorry, I did not indicate the adjusted odds ratios for this, but they have been shown to be significantly important in increasing the risk factors for VTE. Uh, those ones listed there. And I need to point out some of the very uh, issues that some of us do not really think about, like just infections or hyperemesis uh, as an important risk factor for these women uh, having VTE, obesity. But the question would be, when a woman has the these risks, how do you then score them? And how do you then make a decision to start prophylaxis? Uh, all the papers, most of the papers that I've read I've had some differing opinions on exactly how do you do this risk profiling and then how do you make a decision on whether to administer uh, prophylaxis or not to administer prophylaxis. But what comes out very clearly is that uh, women with the definite history of either previous VTE or thrombophilia and phospholipid syndrome obviously need to be started on uh, prophylaxis. Now, uh, when you have this other what we call the other risk factors, then it's upon the clinician to make a judgment on when to start these women on prophylaxis. What is also not known is the dosage of the prophylaxis that you need to start on. Maybe I should just pause at this, on this particular slide and engage the audience a little bit. Uh, I want to hear from the experience of the audience 
um, about some of these risk factors and how have they made you make a different decision when it comes to managing these particular cases. Um, yeah, because I know people don't really like putting up their hands, but I I have uh, Dr. Consolata Kihagi. I, I know you've seen some of these patients. What has made you make a different decision or a particular decision based on this risk, score, risk profiles? Food in the plate. I food. So, so, okay. Sorry, Dr. Consolata. Uh, I know you're at home. Uh, I hear you. Anyone who wants to contribute uh, based on these six factors, how they shaped your decisions? What did you do when you had a patient with obesity in pregnancy? Did you start them straight on on prophylaxis or what, what did you do in your experience? Anyone? Dr. Musimbe? Dr. Maya, I know you put up your hand. I don't know if you can, or you're not guiding me. I can say for, for from my last experience, uh, that is a bit of uh, some time back. Yes. I, I developed a bit of a challenge when I had a patient who had preeclampsia and uh, the decision was based on whether to deliver via CS, of course, or via SVD. The patient had only one episode of a convulsion. But the problem I faced was after delivering the patient, which I used, of course, CS, I uh, think uh, within the first one week, the patient developed a DVT uh, for CS. So I think that was the biggest challenge that I could get. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Maya, Dr. James. Uh, good evening, Prof. Uh, thank good you evening. very much. Um, so when I have uh, probably more than one risk factor, other than the top three that you mentioned, the previous VTE, thrombophilia, a suspicion, and the antiphospholipid syndrome, for which obviously I, as a routine, put them on anticoagulants, uh, a prophylaxis. The others I try to do more of a, a cumulative risk assessment. But if I have more than one, uh, whether it is obesity uh, with an admission that I'm anticipating would probably go more than three days. Uh, they're coming in, a patient who is pregnant coming with an infective process. Uh, probably ad admission with the mobility anticipated, then I put them on anticoagulation. But I agree with you that um, for the other factors, even most of the studies, there's none that is really clear cut that this particular uh, risk factor is one for all, a definitive uh, risk of VTE. So for me, I use more of cumulative risk assessment. And then the, for the top three, um, uh, it's even just one is adequate to do that, uh, to put them on uh, anticoagulation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. James, for that engagement. Yes, so this follows now the second question. So you have a patient maybe with two or three risk factors, uh, maybe their age over 36 years, uh, the history of smoking, and maybe they have a preeclampsia and you, you're making the decision to say you want to give thrombophlexis for this particular patient. Uh, how do you, what informs you, your risk benefit ratio? How, how do you put this, you know, when you expose this woman on thrombophlexis uh, versus you not uh, putting them because they did not have obvious signs of, uh, or, you know, signs or symptoms of uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism, how do you, measure your risk and versus the benefit? What would, you, what would inform you in doing that? And when this is an engagement, a free engagement. I see we have a physician here, uh, Dr. Bundy.
Dr. Bundi. Sorry, Prof. Odimbo, I came in a little late, but uh, what we do in medicine is yes. uh, we use um, the husband, the husband score. Yes. Um, you know, uh, I think that could be a little different from a, a yes. post-CS patients, but uh, we look at the risk of bleeding using the husband score. Mm -hmm. uh, if the patient has thrombocytopenia, has hypertension, yeah. has any bleeding diagnosis, yes. and then we also look at the, the well score uh, for DVT, mm -hmm. for the likelihood of DVT, and we, uh, now we, we weigh both of them. If yes. the husband score is more than two, yeah. then there's a likelihood that the patient is going to bleed uh, on uh, thromboprophylaxis. Great. Yeah. So in essence, what you do, and uh, because I've seen in some cases, we sometimes get blinded and just start giving thrombophylaxis straight, even with the minimal of uh, risk factors. So one has to really be careful because you might give this uh, prophylaxis and end up with uh, more damage to the patient than you're actually helping this particular patient. Again, I'll mention one point that uh, uh, based on insufficient data, we do not have very good uh, risk assessment models uh, for v venous thromboembolic disorders in pregnancy. There have been quite a number that have been developed. Uh, validation for some of them has been a problem. Only a few have been validated, but they did not also meet very high standards of uh, proof. So it's something that we, we, we really need to, to do. I've uh, just given a slide here to show the global burden of uh, VT in, in pregnancy. Uh, but generally, um, we know that thrombosis, either arterial or, or uh, uh, venous, cause significant uh, issues of non-infectious um, uh, causes of death, including myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, and then what you are talking about here, the venous thromboembolism. I, from various countries, and uh, maybe best either on population genetics or otherwise, which you've not studied very well, the incidence of vascular, the venous thromboembolic diseases ranges uh, differently from one country to the, to the next. As I mentioned uh, clearly from the data in the African population, we haven't really uh, synthesized a lot of data in these particular cases. So in Kenya, uh, I mentioned that Dr. Misheni did some work in 2019 and uh, in keeping to what has been observed elsewhere of two per thousand, we had the uh, uh, the prevalence of this at 1.8 per thousand. And also as observed in other studies, most of it were 95% uh, DVT and uh, very few patients pulmonary uh, thromboembolism. And similar epidemiological profiles, as mentioned, uh, most people will have uh, limbs affected, but mostly the uh, left lower limb. And we know the reason why the left lower limb will be mostly affected than the right. The timing, as I mentioned, my first part is that uh, the distribution of this risk is almost, some papers have suggested equal uh, throughout pregnancy, but then of course, others have mentioned during the second part of pregnancy, you have a higher risk of having venous thromboembolic uh, disorders than in the first trimester. Of course, after uh, piperium, in the, during piperium, you also have uh, women at risk of this until six weeks when they normalize. So how do you make diagnosis? And I think I'm not gonna repeat what we, we all know, uh, but I want us to just note some important points that is worse to miss a diagnosis of uh, DVT or venous thromboembolic uh, disease in a patient, because then when you miss this, the outcome of this particular patient uh, is likely to end up in a fatality. Uh, again, as mentioned, just like unlike in non-pregnant state where DVT would be mostly in the calf, in pregnancy, you get most of the DVT in the uh, proximal vasculature, and this would be your femoral uh, vessels. And sometimes they are very difficult to assess then uh, I know we've also heard about this concept of mayer turner syndrome, where during pregnancy as the uterus uh, is growing and the vessels are also expanding, there's that uh, compression of the uh, left common iliac vein 
by the right common iliac artery, and that compression over time results in stasis of in these particular vessels, but at the same time can uh, result in complete obstruction of uh, the left common iliac vein, uh, resulting, of course, in uh, thrombosis in this particular vein. And of course, it's in so doing that we have most of the patients presenting with the left lower limb uh, swelling. So a patient presenting with the left lower limb swelling in pregnancy, you really, of course, have to be watchful of uh, uh, possible uh, venous thromboembolic disease. As I also mentioned that in pregnancy, you'll get these patients having very non-specific symptoms, including lower limb edema. Uh, they have present with the back pain and the pelvic pain, uh, which might be missed or just be confused to be normal happening. So a patient will come and say, oh, this happened during pregnancy. You have a bit of back pain. It will go away after pregnancy. But these patients could actually have uh, uh, venous thromboembolic uh, disease. So you have to be very vigilant and investigate uh, to meet this particular patient treatment. As I know Dr. Bundy has mentioned about the WELLS criteria and the modified Geneva uh, scores, although they have very high sensitivity, uh, they have very poor specificity. Uh, we can apply them, but they, not, they are not very good tools uh, for us to use in uh, obstetric. And I'll just show on what protocol do we you go through when you have a patient suspected of uh, thromboembolic disorder in pregnancy. The use of D-dimers uh, to make a decision is also not very uh, prudent because we know in pregnancy, your levels of D-dimers will definitely be on the higher side. So if you're using the ranges, uh, of course, when there are obvious uh, changes, you'll be noticed, but those very subtle changes might be missed. So they are not very good markers for uh, diagnosis of DVT in pregnancy. So um, this gentleman called Chan in 2009, um, they tried to develop a criteria that you can be able to apply to make this diagnosis. And if you have some time, you can go through uh, this particular paper. And what he had is the left rule and the application of the high sensitive D-dimer tests where you use the red blood cell agglutination D-dimer, and then you combine to these other symptoms, uh, you know, patient coming in with a swelling of the left lower limb, and definitely this, the left lower limb has a greater diameter of more than two centimeters than the right side. So if a patient has these symptoms, plus uh, they're presenting in the first trimester, and then you do the red cell agglutination D-dimer test and you find it's high, then this patient is likely to be having uh, venous thromboembolic uh, disorder or disease, and therefore they qualify for urgent, urgent treatment. Uh, this is just copied from one of the papers uh, on what do you do when a pregnant woman is presenting with uh, DVT or lower extremity symptoms. So when this patient is seen, uh, there are different possibilities. You have either directly when you do the ultrasound, uh, lower limb ultrasound, or you do compression ultrasound to try look at the deep vessels in the pelvis. Then if it's definitely positive for DVT, then you treat the DVT as appropriate, uh, medically or otherwise. Uh, then you, if you've done the ultrasound and it's normal, uh, but suspected iliac venous thrombosis, because then it's harder to see the, uh, with the ultrasound through this, then you could do CT venography or MRI uh, venography. Uh, if it's equivocal, then you want to do this red cell agglutination D-dimer test. And uh, you, do, you do the ultrasound, then you repeat it on day three and repeat it on day seven, and definitely also the D-dimer test. And depending on the outcome, either positive or negative, then you need to uh, repeat accordingly or treat. Then if it's normal, uh, but then there is suspected PE, then there is uh, what you, I'm gonna just mention right now, the YES algorithm or the Geneva uh, modified score system, you start this patient uh, on treatment if you suspect them that they have uh, uh, pulmonary embolism before you even do uh, CTPA 
or the VQ scanning. So as well, just as mentioned with the DVT, for pulmonary embolism, some patients might not really have very clear signs of PE, uh, but then they could present just with very uh, symptom, very mild symptoms of shortness of breath or tachycardia or chest pain. But then these patients present, you also have to have very high index of suspicion. And then you apply the ES algorithms, which definitely would have to use the clinical signs of DVT, the lower limb DVT or the iliofemoral DVT suspected, and then these patients might have a uh, presence of hemoptysis. And then if you have this and you're suspecting this patient uh, has any of these two symptoms, then this patient is likely to have pulmonary embolism and you then need to investigate. But of course, as you're investigating, you need to start these patients on treatment. Uh, there's been quite a bit of argument on whether to use uh, CTPA and VQ in pregnancy, but they're of course known to be safe in pregnancy and this antipiparium, and you can use them. Of course, their risks, are, uh, benefits outweigh the risks they pose for these particular patients. So these ones we know, and I think I just mentioned this slide uh, to uh, keep us in check because quite a number of our patients present with a superficial thrombophilibitis. Uh, which you have the varicose veins, then in in within could have some clots. Uh, important to note that uh, though it's called thrombophilibitis, basically it's a clot, but the redness is because of that particular swelling. Then you have the DVT, and as I mentioned, seventy percent of DVT in pregnancy will present within the proximal vessels. So, if a patient has superficial thrombophilibitis, what do you do? Uh, these patients mostly uh, would just need very minimal care uh, and you manage those symptoms based on the vessels that are presenting. And uh, if there's some pain, you give analgesic, you can also give compression stockings and, and ask this patient uh, where their legs are elevated. Of course, they encourage ambulation and so forth. And the patients will normally present with a pain, uh, redness around these vessels, and sometimes you might feel these vessels uh, with these pregnant women. For the calf, uh, DVT uh, would normally occur within the legs. About 20% of women would have this. It may be easy to pick because you see obvious changes in the limbs and the skin and the temperature. The diameter of the limbs might be different then uh, most of it actually would spontaneously resolve, uh, but some of it would, uh, if not treated in good time, can be uh, continue and become the pulmonary embolism. So if untreated, about 50% of patients with calf, emboli uh, calf uh, DVT would end up with a pulmonary embolism. Of course, we mentioned why the left side is more affected uh, than the right. But most of the time, it's also important to note that uh, during this particular process, because of the involvement of the iliofemoral uh, vessels and their closeness, especially with the arterial system in the pelvis, the arteries might undergo some spasms. And therefore, these women might also present with some features of ischemia of their, <clears throat> of their lower limbs. Uh, studies done amongst different uh, a, a group of pregnant women, and they just to emphasize why uh, it appears to be mostly on the left side. And clearly, you can see uh, the proximal uh, side, proximal vessels more involved, and then on the left side, more involved than on the right side. And this anatomically so because the uterus presses far on the ileal vessel in the left side of the pelvis than on the right, than on the right side, and you have more of this patient presenting on the left side. So what are these protocols? And as I mentioned in my first slide, that we do not have very good risk assessment tools. That gives us an opportunity uh, for us to look at the data that we have, and especially now with the tools that we also have on machine, deep machine learning and application of AI, to be able to profile 
uh, women with different risk factors and be able to expose them to treatment as necessary. Uh, so regardless of this very high risk of uh, VT in pregnancy, most women actually will not need any anticoagulation. And as I mentioned, it's left at the clinician kind of uh, assessment uh, to determine with this risk as you score them one by one uh, to determine if this patient needs anticoagulation or does not need anticoagulation. And of course, you weigh that with the risk of giving that anticoagulation. What is preferred mostly is the low molecular weight heparin. And we, in our setup, we know how we apply this. But I've also seen uh, very anecdotal use of the uh, low molecular weight uh, heparins. Someone would decide, for example, for Clexen, do I give 40, do I give 60, do I give uh, 80, do I give 120? Uh, how do I give uh, this particular dose? Uh, we also have a, quite a gray area in that administration protocol. Then definitely, as I mentioned, especially for the first three women with thrombophilia, women previous history of uh, venous thromboembolic diseases, and of course, uh, those women with antiphospholipid syndromes will definitely require pharmacological uh, thrombophylaxis. And as I mentioned, the lack of guidance on exactly how much dose to use is a subject of discussion, and we're still looking for more data to guide that particular uh, assessment. The RCOG recommends that uh, once you've done the risk assessment and they have a tool that you can use to tick uh, on the risk assessment for this particular women within pregnancy on postpartum period, then you can administer prophylaxis as uh, required. And this is just one of the uh, uh, flowcharts that you want to use. And if you're getting either high predicted recurrence risk of a pregnant woman who had a previous history of VTE, then you want to start them on prophylactic and you want to use intermediate uh, dose of uh, the low molecular weight heparin. Uh, if there's low predicted recurrence risk, then uh, you will know that during pregnancy, uh, you have these hormonal changes, you get the estrogenic state, and therefore it's also uh, good to start these women on prophylaxis as needed. Uh, there's been this call, and you can go check on it on the guiding the risk assessment for women with the venous thromboembolism and developed by about 19 physicians, French physicians. And their conclusion was uh, they had a tool that had various items, various risks that uh, some of the risks that we already mentioned before. And then each of the risks you tick. And when they get to a certain level of the risk, then you be able to administer. And that's one of the tools that I'd want uh, this audience to go look at. It's one of the tools, very few tools that have been validated in pregnancy and has shown great success in uh, treating those women who are at risk of thrombotic events while also significantly reducing uh, treatment of women who are at low risk and therefore reducing the risk of bleeding uh, from this particular group of women. For the treatment, uh, we look at the standard uh, treatment, though we know that most preferred is the low molecular weight uh, subcutaneous uh, heparin and it's given immediately the diagnosis is suspected, not really confirmed. So when you have a patient with suspected DVT or suspected uh, PE, you start the treatment until now you are able to exclude by those other measures, including the compression ultrasound or CTPA or VQ or D-dimer tests or what we talked about, the year scoring uh, uh, system. Then, the treatment aim, definitely, we know from the hematological point of view, we need to uh, achieve the rate of about APTT of 2 to 2.5 uh, within 5 to 7 days. And then we continue with that prophylaxis day, uh, dose until 6 to 12 weeks postnatal. And then after that, you assess because most of these women are at risk of developing uh, more clots even three months after pregnancy. So you continue that, then you can assess 
and see whether the risk has been diminished. Some will have to continue uh, throughout their lives. Some will have to stop after three months of uh, treatment. But for those with confirmed PE, then their treatment has to be continued at least up to six months postnatal uh, in this particular regard. Uh, we know that heparin uh, or the low molecular weight version of it, unlike the unfractionated heparin, is uh, the recommended treatment because of it's not being able to cross the placenta. But then if in case of an overdose, you can also reverse that particular overdose. As uh, Dr. Bundy mentioned, we always have to watch against uh, thrombocytopenia and these patients who are on long-term treatment with uh, heparin. And uh, that's something that uh, you involve the hematologist in terms of the multidisciplinary team approach to care to have this patient managed. And of course, never forget the role of mechanical compression in both uh, superficial uh, thrombophilobitis to calf DVT and limb elevation. And of course, the role of this treatment is to make sure that these patients do not experience the long-term complications of uh, thromboembolic diseases. My final slide to just uh, get a few uh, ideas from the audience. So you have this uh, patient who is a 36 year old. Uh, she's 28 weeks pregnant. Uh, she had um, a myomectomy. I think this was supposed to be a year before. Uh, and now she's flying from Nairobi to Dodoma in Tanzania. Uh, she notes uh, that although her mother had a case of superficial thrombophlebitis and her brother had DVT after a 12 hour flight, herself, she never had any history of uh, uh, venous thromboembolism. So, what would you do for this particular patient who is uh, traveling? Uh, and this is by air to Dodoma from Nairobi. I just want to hear your opinion and what is guiding your opinion in this particular case. Dr. Anjohi? Dr. George Wanjohi? Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I think due to the family history, I think uh, we should put on prophylaxis. Okay. Uh, we've talked of low but maybe the lowest dose. Okay, right. Anyone who has a different opinion? Kelvin, Mutwiri? Uh, hello, everyone. I think in view also of the age and the previous uh, issue of myomectomy, I tend to agree with probably uh, below dose prophylaxis and with that history of. Great, thank you very much, Kelvin. Yes, so uh, I, I just wanted, the reason I put this question here, uh, I wanted to have a follow-up question is um, from colleagues uh, on this particular platform, do you think we do enough thrombophylaxis for our patients who present uh, to us in various ways? Or do you feel there's a limitation on what should guide you in making those particular decisions? I just want to hear two or three opinions because I know we are just about time right now, actually almost maybe two minutes. Uh, what do you think should be done for you to improve uh, the quality of care for patients who are at risk of uh, thrombophylaxis and thrombolic diseases. Um, maybe our, some of our senior colleagues here, Dr. George Guaco.
Uh, Dr. George, we can't hear you very well. Oh, I, I think maybe you have some connection issues there. Dr. Maureen, OIT. Uh, as of course as we wait to hear from her we can yes. have a, a short uh, interlude about some of the uh, the challenges with the question is a 36 year old sorry sorry uh, this side has moved 36 year old woman who's 20, 28 weeks pregnant and has a neck to me once before and is flying from Nairobi to Doma. Of course, uh, we know that most of the patients do not fly. <laughs> but for, for example, if you get those that fly, most of them will want to be reassured about their the thrombophilaxis state. She knows that although her mother had a case of superficial thrombophilibitis and her brother had a DVT after a 12 hour flight, she has no prior history of VT. How far would you go to help this woman? So as we reiterate the question, uh, someone had raised their hand up. Dr. Andrew Chege. Dr. Andrew Chege. Okay, then maybe we can allow Professor Zahida Qureshi to to tell us maybe from my experience, what has been her experience with this disorder, especially. Our teacher, Professor Zahida Qureshi. Welcome, Prof. Just take it up from there to say, does the... Um, time of the flight, the distance that the person will be traveling um, matter. And I presume that from Nairobi to Radoma is a short flight. Um, thinking there is a role for aspirin, use of aspirin in this patient. Um, maybe also to advise her just to do, you know, passive exercises. Um, my little experience with patients who've traveled even long distances just to um, give them that advice. Uh, maybe, you know, the pressure stockings, the traveling stock stockings. Um, so I really don't have experience in actually giving proper prophylaxis. So maybe I'm here to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. I, I just had an additional question to the audience. Uh, for those of us who do caesarean section and say after 12 hours or 24 hours, do we have protocols in our units that um, administer uh, thrombophylaxis to the patient for caesarean section? And do we routinely do this? Uh, do we have some people who don't do it? And if you don't do it, why don't you do it? Anything, just two, two, two minutes, sorry, going over time right now. I think we can read one of the answers from James A, who says okay. that uh, agree on thrombophilaxis can be considered, but how long is a flight from Nairobi to Dodoma can consider compression stockings intentionally, activity of lower limb muscles and avoid immobility. I think uh, during the thrombosis seminar last week, we discussed about some, some doctors even having to have uh, small injection of a low molecular weight heparin when they have a long flight for a congress, maybe 24 hour flight. I don't know what's your experience with this. And uh, of course, as professors alluded to aspirin being one of the ways people with thrombophilax before travel, though aspirin in pregnancy can have some different reservations of the same.
Right. So thank you very much, Dr. Maya. So with that, uh, in my summary, that uh, thromboembolism is a serious uh, problem in uh, pregnancy and can potentially lead to uh, morbidity and mortality. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to just make a clinical uh, diagnosis, but once suspected, uh, you need to start treatment immediately uh, until you objectively exclude the presence of this clot, as mentioned. We have the diagnostic tools that we should not be shy uh, using them, Doppler scanning, compression, ultrasound scanning. Uh, then we have the VQ scans and CTPA. Then we need to get some good data and especially look at some of the risk scoring tools to look at the uh, protocols of administration of thrombophylaxis, um, especially using the low molecular weight uh, heparin that is uh, much preferred. Uh, we know that uh, we need as much as possible avoid uh, the use of uh, oral anticoagulants like warfarin, especially in the first trimester because of their uh, congenital uh, defects they can potentially cause. So um, those are the key points that we want to pass across, but then it remains to us because I know we don't have very good guidelines which we need to strengthen on when and how to apply. So there's room for more research to be done to develop better guidelines for us to use. But then again, it's also important to note a large percentage of women who deserve thrombophylaxis do not get it and are likely to suffer from long-term consequences of untreated uh, thromboembolic diseases. So with that, I want to thank everyone and I will hand it back to you, Dr. Maya. So uh, thanks, Dr. Ari. And uh, I think you've mentioned quite a bit and uh, maybe you can take some of the questions online. And uh, I think we'll start with the first question. Uh, okay. Does bridging the dose of warfarin and low molecular weight heparin for active VT recommended in pregnancy? We've already answered this in terms of first trimester. Yeah. Right? Yes. And uh, that answers the second question, which is, is warfarin given at any point during pregnancy, say in the second trimester? Yeah. And uh, maybe we can uh, we can look at Carol Caroline's question. I feel like I feel like I feel like I feel like she would need from prophylaxis as she's 35 family history of DVT. Is it possible that there is some thrombophilia in the family? Maybe uh, what can you give us in terms of thrombophilia in Kenya? Many people are usually mention this in most CMEs, but uh, the data on thrombophilia is not really well established. I know there's a thrombophilia clinic at Kenyatta. Maybe you can give some word on this thrombophilia in pregnancy. Yeah, I have not checked the actual uh, data on the burden of thrombophilia in this country, but definitely we definitely have patients with this particular problem. And uh, well, especially in this particular case, I suppose she's a high risk uh, woman based on that family history, though not investigated. Part of the management is to advise uh, to get those investigations done. And uh, since uh, you make a decision to give thrombophylaxis uh, for this particular woman, when you start doing the so, when are you going to stop giving this thrombophylaxis? So you probably need to do uh, more investigations for this particular uh, woman and then let her fly either on thrombophylaxis or just on those uh, supportive ways of treatment. Thank you so much, Doc. Uh, maybe another question, uh, unprovoked versus provoked pregnancy uh, DVT. And uh, kindly uh, please talk about what you, may, you meant by long-term three-month or six-month prophylaxis and therapy in provoked versus unprovoked thrombosis in pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. so as we mentioned that the patients who have, uh, of course, at risk or con confirmed, either at risk or confirmed 
then there are those protocols that you need to treat uh, either three months uh, for pulmonary embolism, then six months. But then that just means you need to reassess these patients when they when they come at the end of that treatment period. You want to determine are they still at high risk or are they uh, now out of risk? Of course, if still at high risk, then you want to continue with the treatment. And as I mentioned, some of the treatment would go on for life. Some of them would have an end. Uh, but most importantly is to involve a multidisciplinary team and it's good to have a hematologist on board because we know some of these medications have side effects, as we mentioned, affecting the platelets and so forth. And of course, we also know that the costs implication of long-term treatment uh, need to be taken care of. So you need to have a hematologist, you need to have a physician, then you have a gynecologist, and if there's need to have an interventional cardiologist and so forth, so you have a team that uh, gets to manage this particular patient. Okay, well, one last, one second last, let's call it a second last question. Uh, what is the benefit of, of course, mechanical versus uh, pharmacological? This is compressional stockings in DVT in pregnancy. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the decision whether to use uh, either mechanical or uh, medical uh, therapy is also based on the patient risk uh, scoring. And uh, for the low risk, for example, patients with uh, superficial thrombophlebitis, then it would make sense for you to apply mechanical uh, you know, uh, treatment like compression, stalking, elevation, uh, ambulation, and so forth. Uh, for patients who are definitely at uh, higher risk, then you want to combine both medical and uh, mechanical treatment. Uh, we'll know that the mechanical treatment will be cheaper, maybe easier to access, and so forth, and with less side effects as opposed to the medical treatment. Uh, so that would also depend on the patient that's ahead of you, and you make that decision accordingly. So uh, I think the last question would be kindly uh, touch on, uh, of course, post-CS uh, thrombosis, especially if you have a patient who has uh, adjacent risk factors, according to ARCOG. Um, I missed that question. Post CS thrombosis, okay. uh, mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. took ARCOG and uh, patient mm -hmm. with the risk factors, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and I know in many places, patients post uh, surgery uh, within 12 to 24 hours of uh, having that surgical procedure, uh, most patients would have prophylaxis, uh, thromboprophylaxis. Uh, uh, the question here is, uh, for how long do you want to continue this prophylaxis? That's why I've been seeing a gap. Some people do two days, some people do three days, some people do three weeks post-surgery. So what guides uh, your treatment? Uh, when to use a week of uh, thromboprophylaxis, whether to use um, you know, a day and so forth. So generally in pregnancy, for example, like in uh, CS, uh, most people have seen they apply a three-day uh, prophylaxis. Uh, for those that are at a higher risk, then they will go all the way to about three weeks of treatment. Now for uh, women who are breastfeeding, they discourage the use of oral uh, anticoagulants. And uh, they, of course, pr promote the use of the low molecular weight heparins, but for those who are not breastfeeding, then they can go on um, oral anticoagulants. Of course, for other cases, the other gynec cases, after the uh, thrombophylaxis, low heparin, molecular weight heparins, one can go straight on to oral uh, anticoagulants after the 72 hours of treatment. Oh, that's um, uh, quite a comprehensive answer. So I think the last question I will take before we close up is uh, what can we do in our local stations to improve uh, or surveillance on thrombo thrombosis and of course thrombophylaxis and bridging? Yeah, so th this is an open forum question that uh, I would definitely have been happier to hear from the audience, but I know we are over time now. 
uh, we, we, my, my take is that for us to be able to make any credible decisions, we always need data. Data is our pillar and our strength. And data means that in our various institutions, it's good for us to collect data, especially on patients and the experiences, and uh, you know, publish some articles that would show or demonstrate the burden of this disease because it's there in the communities, there in our hospitals. So the first thing is to have data. The second thing is to know that this problem exists and almost 50% of patients, 25 to 50% of patients do not receive treatment that they deserve. So um, once we get data, then it would help us have good policy frameworks and guidelines to help all of us to, of course, contribute first to the knowledge. Number two, contribute even to the development of the risk assessment tools that we are now learning that are not very good and robust at the moment. And then number three, uh, our own local data would be unique and in good context for our own population because we can't also rely so much on the West to give us the scoring criteria they're using and applying on the population, which could significantly be different from what we are having. Uh, and finally, I think I just want to emphasize on this point that thrombophylaxis, post zero section, uh, post-surgical procedures is important and at the minimum would cause uh, uh, no harm to the patient. So uh, I think that is uh, the last question. Maybe Dr. you can wave to the audience. Maybe your video was off. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they've, they've, they've not seen how young you are. So. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> I think I just didn't realize this. But yeah, thank you very much for your patience. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, as is that, uh, it was a short uh, presentation. And uh, I think uh, the key aspects was uh, to assess the, the thrombosis risk and uh, to assess the bleeding risk. Then assess the duration of therapy with the risk factors involved, and then of course, institute uh, therapy. Though we may not know what are the real maternal mortality uh, numbers as regards to thrombosis and others, but of course we expect COGS to give us these numbers soon enough. Thank you COGS for hosting us. Do we know if we have any member of COGS to say something before we close? Any member of COGS, Dr. Ari? Uh, yes, I'm here. I know uh, Gabriela is also here. Maybe she wants to say something, then she closes, yeah. Gabriela, you're welcome. Please don't tell them to pay their membership. <laughs> Gabriela, please. Um, sorry, everybody. It's uh, Ian here. I think Gabriela just um, logged off a few minutes ago. It's been an honor hosting you, and we look forward to more CMEs. Okay, thank you so much, guys. Uh, my name again is Dr. Amaya Muko, uh, medical advisor Sonofi, and. Uh, we really thank you guys for taking time to take part in this very important CME. I can still see many people are still chatting and uh, sending questions. And we remember to make sure that your facility is at least uh, maternal certified safety, meaning that uh, of course our, our mothers are able to give birth safely in your facility. And they're able to understand the risks and dangers of, of course, thrombosis as regards to DVT and PE. Uh, to all who have attended today, thank you so much. Uh, I think Kongs will provide CME, uh, sorry, CPD points for the same. Have a nice night. And uh, remember, always prevent uh, thrombosis before we have to deal with mortality. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari, so much for your time. Thank you very much, thanks. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, Cogs, for this opportunity. We can end the scene.